Now this this, this is by incidence wise, this is the first most important cancer uh, as per incidence of the tumor. Furthermore, the while the number of cases are decreasing world over of gastric cancer in India, the numbers are increasing. In in about in about say 15 years back, we had a 35,000 cancer. Now we have 50,000 cancers in 2018. So certainly there's increase in frequency of gastric cancer, and we might have to relook at uh, our concept of uh, uh, gastric cancer as pleuri enigma in India. It may not be true. So with that, uh, uh, we learned quite a lot in gastric cancer. Now we we move to one other very important cancer, uh, which we deal with, which is a uh, we believe that which is preventable. Uh, if you detect polyp, you and you can prevent gast uh, colorectal cancer. So today we'll have a panel discussion on colorectal cancer, and which is equally important. And we are happy to uh, introduce our moderator and panelist, which I would say this is a dream panel uh, one can think of in our country on this topic. And for that, we have moderator Dr. Mahesh Goenka. I think it's a very name, very familiar to everyone. And uh, he is a, uh, a wonderful gastroenterologist, uh, very smart in endoscopist, great teacher. Because he had been... Uh, he has been my teacher, so I know uh, the great qualities he had as a teacher. And and again, we know very accomplished uh, gastroenterologist and member of our society. So he'll moderate uh, this session. So he has uh, uh, created three cases on which we have panel discussion. And for panelists, uh, we have let me introduce Dr. Rohin Mittal. Dr. Rohin Mittal is uh, is a uh, surgeon. He's a uh, GI surgeon at uh, CMC Vellore. He's a uh, and his main interest is uh, uh, colorectal disorders, IBD and uh, and cancer. We have Dr. Again Atul Sarma. Uh, he joined uh, us in one other team panel discussion. Dr. Atul Sarma is a professor of uh, medical oncology at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Again, very dear friend and very accomplished uh, GI oncologist. Uh, we have Dr. Ankur Goyal. Uh, Ankur Goyal is again a dear colleague. Uh, he's uh, a, radio, a radiologist, and he's at again at Ames, New Delhi. We have uh, one other colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Saista. Uh, she's from TMC Mumbai, but uh, because of some native issues, she's not able to join. But certainly, she'll join shortly. Uh, with this, we welcome all the panelists and uh, and the moderator uh, to have a, again one more panel discussion on colorectal cancer. With this, let me invite Dr. Uh, Vivek Saraswat to welcome you again, and and uh, then we go to panel discussion. Uh, thank you, Govind. Uh, good morning once again to the moderator, the panelists, and all the participants on this ISG masterclass. Well, it's been a long run. We are uh, completing six months now almost. We began on 16th April, and we are now coming close to 15th October. And this is the 31st session on the masterclasses. We have had didactic lectures on topics that are very close to our core constituency, which has been the DM and the DNB uh, gastroenterology trainees all over the country. And uh, lately we have covered something that I think uh, has been a revelation and a great learning exercise for all of us, participants, as well as moderators and panelists. And that is this, this uh, series of panel discussions on GI oncology, a major but uh, not often highlighted um, segment of uh, gastroenterology that we have tried to cover in these last seven panel discussions. So um, uh, colorectal cancer and in fact the GI oncology, I think uh, Professor Atul Sharma was just remarking a short while ago, constitute almost a quarter of all uh, malignancies in our country and in the world. And uh, uh, they, the multidisciplinary approach, which is the heart of at the heart of GI oncology wherever it is best practiced, is something that needs to merge into other areas of gastroenterology, hepatology, biliopancreatology practice also. And um, I think uh, if anything, what we have learned in this series of seven panel discussions is that a multidisciplinary approach can not just be one plus one plus one, but has a multiplier effect and uh, it can really improve outcomes in what to us uh, especially old-timer gastroenterologists like myself appears, uh, end of the road, terminal, nothing much we can offer other than comfort care. Well, the scenario has greatly changed and uh, that has become clear in this session of GI oncology. 
So without further ado, I think I will uh, uh, request uh, Professor uh, Mahesh Goenka, uh, who will talk to us about the session as well as uh, um, lead the panel discussion uh, today. Uh, Mahesh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, Govind. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, quite clearly. So, uh, I must thank Indian Society of Gastroenterology and the President and the Secretary for giving me this chance. Uh, I know this uh, over the last few months, this session has become almost a routine for most uh, of us. And we have attended a majority of these sessions. And I'm sure that guys are going to miss it for the next few weeks. I also know that this is the last session in the series. And so we have an added responsibility that uh, we give, leave a lasting impression on the other gastroenterologists about these sessions. So uh, uh, with that, let me start with my presentation and can I... Uh, is my slide seen? Yes. Sir. Yes, yes, we can do that. See you screen nicely. Uh, let me full screen, sir. Yeah, one second. Okay. So, um, uh, we know that uh, colorectal cancer in India is somewhat less common compared to the rest of the world. Uh, overall, in the world, in the global scenario, it forms a second commonest cancer in females and third commonest cancer in male. Uh, this is the incidence, and you can see the India is represented here, both for the incidence as well as the mortality, and it comes somewhere in the lower in the graph. But if you look at the predictions, by 2035, it's predicted that every year there will be 2.5 million new cases, and this is primarily because there is increasing number in developing countries. And what is alarming is that uh, there will be more cancers in younger age, and more cancers will be rectal, and more cancer will be left sided. And this is really alarming. Now, if you look at the Indian scenario, and this is from Global, Global Can 2018 Indian Fact Seed, uh, among the males, among the new cases, and there were total about 11,57,000 new cases of cancer in this year, 2018, half in the males and half in the females. In the males, you look at that fourth number is colorectal cancer. So about 36,000 new cases in 2018 among male, and among female, it was fifth, sixth, which would be around 20,000 new cases of colorectal cancer in 2018. Overall, if you look at prevalence of cancer in India, colorectal cancer will constitute fourth commonly prevalent cancer, just after breast, oral, cervical, and then colorectal cancer. So, while compared to the global scenario, the global rectal cancer may be less common in India, but because of the population and because of the increasing number, I think it's very important. And uh, that's where we are, that we'll be discussing today, as Vivek and Govind told you, a multimodality treatment for colorectal cancer. So, the learning points for this today's meeting is that we would discuss about preoperative staging, we would discuss the new adjuvant chemoradiotherapy, we will talk about types of surgery, we will talk about adjuvant chemotherapy and the follow-up protocol. And as you said, uh, it's a dream uh, company for me. We have Dr. Sajitha Mehta, who is likely to join us very soon. She's the professor and head of the Department of Gastroenterology at Patamay Memorial Hospital. Dr. Rohin Mittal is professor at the Department of GI Surgery in CMC Velo. And then we have two colleagues from All India Institute, Dr. Atul Sharma, who is a medical oncologist, and Dr. Ankur Goyal, who is a radiologist. What we did is that we shared some of the cases from my side with uh, the four colleagues over the last two days, and we framed some questions, and I have some of their answers, which has come to me yesterday night or today morning, which I've incorporated in this presentation. So before we start the discussion and show you the cases, I think a, a little bit of refreshing of the ENM staging for colorectal cancer is important. Uh, this has been changing, and now what we follow is eighth edition from American Joint Committee on Cancer. This is the detail criteria, which has a scale 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and each is divided into further subclasses. But I like the slide which was given to me by Ankur yesterday. Uh, to simplify this, and I will run through it for everybody's knowledge. I think it is important that when you deal with a colorectal cancer, you must, must stage them at various levels, clinically, after the radiological imaging, at surgery and then finally at pathology so that you can decide how to proceed in an algorithm way. So stage zero we know is carcinoma in situ. 
Stage one is either T1 or T2, depending on the tumor extent. T1 is when the tumor extends into the submucosa, and T2 is when the tumor is extends into the muscular proctory. So when there is no node involved, this will be stage one, T1, T2. Stage two is T3 or T4, without again nodes involvement. T3 is tumor extending out of muscular propria, that means in the pericolonic fossa. And four is when it involves the peritoneum or the adjacent structure. So tumor involving the visceral peritoneum is 414A, and those which go to adjacent structure, visceral infiltration is 4B. Once the nodes are involved, then it becomes stage three, which is N1, which is one to three regional lymph nodes involved, and N2 when four or more regional lymph nodes are involved. And then, of course, there is metastatic tumor, which is stage four. 41A is when one organ is involved, and 41B is when more than one organ is involved. So this is very, very important. And I think anybody who is dealing with colorectal cancers must remember them uh, before, because this will be the Bible to treat our cases. So with that, let me go into the first case of today. This is a relatively simple case, but I thought we must, uh, we do, do deal with these cases on a regular basis. So we must go through this uh, important. Now, this individual, a 47 years old female, was seen by us about a month back when she presently was with intermittent constipation, anorexia, and weight loss, known hypertensive, hypothyroid, no previous surgery, no family history. So the initial investigation showed a hemoglobin of 10.4, bilirubin, uh, LFT was normal except the uh, mild elevation of ALT, other back strip was normal, ultrasound was normal, chest X-ray was normal. Obviously, at this time, we do COVID PCR and that was negative. So we had this uh, colonoscopy done as the initial investigation and we could cross this tumor, which was in the sigmoid colon. And this was a large ulcerative proliferative polypoidal mass in the sigmoid colon, around 30 centimeter from the anorectal perch. And the passage of endoscope to the lumen was smooth with no stricture. We did a carcinoembryonic antigen and this was less than 0.5 nanogram per ml. I don't know whether Saista has joined already or not. Yes, sir, joint. Saista, so, uh, my first question to you, Saista, is can you uh, address the issue of CEA in suspected CRC? And these are your slides, uh, Saista. Yes. So, sir, uh, for the students, uh, the where is the CEA secreted from? It's a glycoprotein that is secreted from the columnar and the uh, goblet cells in the normal colonic cell, in the normal colonic mucosa. It is also secreted by colorectal cancer cells. Normally, it is secreted in the serum, uh, and it is tested in serum. But you also, we can also test it in other other body fluids. The normal result is usually less than five nanograms per ml. But we want, we would like the students to note that thirty percent of colorectal cancers, including those who have relapses and meds, have normal CEA. So CEA is neither sensitive nor specific for colorectal cancer, and therefore we do not employ it as a screening tool. However, CE is very useful for surveillance, uh, pre-operatively -pre and also for surveillance. So if a patient has a raised CEA and it continues to rise in the surveillance period, definitely it's a poor prognosis because we consider that the treatment is not, the patient is not responding to the treatment. Whereas, if I'll please go to the next slide, sir. The next slide. Um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, uh, this is your second slide. Yes, so high pre -op high CEA levels in the preoperative stage are considered prognostic. They correlate very well with advanced TNM, TNN stage. They are indicators of worse five-year survival in stage two and stage three. A CEA of more than 10 is known to be associated with shorter recurrence-free survival. And if you have very high CA levels of more than 275 with low albumin, then the overall survival is also very short. So overall, I would conclude by saying that CA is a prognostic marker and useful in the surveillance period. And preoperative CA levels can help us in a big way to guide treatment. Thank you, uh, uh, Shaista. We will come back to this uh, as to how should we follow up these patients and what interval we should do for CA. Uh, towards later part of our discussion. So this patient has a colonoscopy biopsy which showed irregularly branched dilated tubulovillous structures, severe dysplasia with foci of malignancy. So uh, this is a CT scan which was done outside the institute. So pardon me for the quality of that CT scan, but what you can see is a large polypoidal mass here. 
uh, which is almost uh, extending into the pericolic tissues. You can see the fastest stranding here. So there was a sigmoid growth with pericolic at stranding with no nodes. So my question to the radiologist, Dr. Pankur, is are you happy with motorway investigation? The pre-surgery uh, pre, uh, we have done, or you would like you would have liked to have some more investigations, uh, Dr. Pankur? So in a suspected case of colorectal cancer, contrast enhanced CT of the abdomen and pelvis with IV and rectal contrast is the investigation of choice. So in this particular case, the patient has already underwent CT abdomen and pelvis with rectal contrast. And we are able to see the mass very well. We can do its little uh, local staging also very well. However, if the suspicion is high of a colonic malignancy, then it's always better to acquire the CT chest as well because this then completes the staging. So uh, the literature is divided whether a chest x-ray should be done or a CT chest should be done. But majority of the guidelines are that CT chest is better and it serves as a baseline for comparison and for emergence of any new nodules on the chest. So we have a baseline scan. It is important to note here that PET CT has no role in routine preoperative staging of colonic malignancies. It is only used if, let's say, the CT is equivocal, if CT picks up a lesion in the lung, so let's say there is an 8mm nodule which is equivocal, then it may be done. Or when a radical surgery or limited metastatectomy is planned, in those cases, one may go and do a PET CT to rule out extensive metastasis. I think, Ankur, uh, you are very uh, focused on the discussion. And I think this is one of the important messages from this presentation is that don't do unnecessary tests. Uh, we often see a PET scan being done in all colonic malignancies, many places, but I think you have rightly pointed out all we need a good CT scan if it is not a rectal tumor, an MRI is possibly not required, and a good CT evaluation. In this case, we did a CT chest, a chest x ray, but you rightly pointed out a CT chest would have been a better option. So uh, let me now move to Dr. Rohin as to what surgery, what are the options for surgery in this case? Okay, right. So in colonic lesions, the surgery is dictated by where the lesion is located. Uh, there are lots of types of hemicolectomies and uh, in this slide you can see that there are a few which I have crossed out. So the ones that I have crossed out are used only for benign disease and they are not used for cancer. So a limited right hemicolectomy may be used for Crohn's disease but is not used for cancer. A transverse colectomy also is not used for cancer. They are not considered oncologically sound operations. For right-sided lesions, we would do a right hemicolectomy, like if the tumor is in the cecum or if the tumor is in the ascending colon. If the tumor is next to the hepatic flexure or proximal transverse colon, we would do what you can see in figure B here, an extended right hemicolectomy. Uh, figure C is actually a transverse colectomy and this is not done for cancer. Uh, if the tumor is in the uh, left side of the colon, then we do a left hemicolectomy. And depending on where the tumor is, whether it's next to the splenic flexure or next to the descending colon, the amount of uh, colon dissected will vary, like we can see in figure D and figure E here. If the tumor is in the sigmoid colon, like in this patient, we would do a sigmoid colectomy or sometimes even an anterior resection, depending on the exact location of the tumor. These can be done uh, laparoscopic, these can be done open, or these can be done robotic. Now, there are a select group of patients where we need to remove a much larger portion of the uh, colon uh, rather than just the involved segment. And these are usually when we find multiple polyps or if somebody has got, you know, uh, hereditary uh, non-polyposis colon cancer or where there's a genetic uh, component. And there we do something called a subtotal colectomy and the ileum is anastomosed to the rectum. Uh, can we have the next slide? Yeah. So now the big question that a lot of patients ask us is, should we do this open? Should we do this laparoscopic or should we do this robotic? I mean, there are various uh, proponents uh, for everything. Uh, the important thing to realize is that the oncological outcomes for all these things are similar. So the actual removal of the tumor is exactly the same whether we do it open, whether we do it laparoscopic or whether we do it uh, uh, robotic, provided it is done well. A well done open operation is sometimes better than a badly done laparoscopic operation. Uh, minimal access like laparoscopy and robotics only have short term benefits like a better pain relief, a shorter hospital stay, a smaller scar, less adhesions. But as far as the cancer is concerned, the outcomes are exactly the same as per current literature. Uh, so uh, each of them is uh, actually all right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rohin. So this patient had a, a laparoscopy-assisted surgery. Uh, is the video running? All right. So uh, four ports were created. Sigmoid was mobilized. Lower end was transected after ligating. Proximal end was taken out to the midline incision, divided between the clamps. 
uh, EEA scapula was introduced to the anus, stapled anastomosis was done, and an air leak test was negative. The patient was discharged on day three. So this is a resected specimen, and I think uh, we don't have a pathologist on the panel, but I think pathologist plays an important role in the multidisciplinary approach to give us the right assessment of the pathological specimen, both at colonoscopy as well as the resected specimen. And I have uh, outlined some of the points here. But they have to mention the tumor size in all dimensions. This was 5.5 into 3.7 into 2.5. Tumor extension, uh, like laterally, it involves muscular spopria and polyrectal tissue. So this was T, T3. The histology was mucinous adenocarcinoma. The margins were not involved. Radial margin, 70 millimeter uh, gap. Proximal margin, 85 millimeter. And the distal margin, 110 millimeters. Lymphovascular invasion was not there. Perineural invasion was not there. Tumor budding, which actually indicates that clusters of tumors at the margin of the main tumor was very low, 0 to 1. This is, again, another prognostic factors. What was underlying polyp? This was tubular villus. And there were 17 uh, resected lymph nodes in this uh, colectomy specimen, and none of them were positive. Uh, I must say that for a, uh, and Rohin will agree with me, that for a good surgery, there should be at least 12 lymph nodes which should be removed. So if there are less than 12 lymph nodes, it will indicate that the lymph adenectomy was not done uh, properly or incomplete, and this may be an indication for an adjuvant therapy. So after resected specimen, the P staging was T3 because periodontal tissue was involved, N0, and this was a stage 2 disease as shown by this histology here. So uh, my next question to Dr. Atul Sharma, is there any role for adjuvant chemotherapy in this patient or in similar patients? Can you tell us something about adjuvant chemotherapy in non-rectal colonic cancers? All right. So thank you, Dr. Goenka. So basically, can we move to the next slide? So basically, this particular person falls into the category of stage 2A, T3, adequate lymph node dissection. If we go to the period, if you go to the history, then patient did not have any obstructive symptom. There was no evidence of the perforation. So nowadays, what we talk about the colon cancer, whenever we want to consider someone for the adjuvant treatment after the adequate surgery. So basically, one line answer is that all those who have node positive disease definitely require some form of the adjuvant treatment. And now the standard is auxiliary platinum and 5 if you are capsitating this. That is number one. Second thing is that when we should start treatment, usually between within eight weeks, but delaying beyond 12 weeks may be detrimental. Can we move on to the next one? Next one. So since this patient had stage two, the various societies have pulled together data and have suggested that not all patients of the stage 2 colon cancer require adjuvant treatment. There are certain high-risk features which require adjuvant treatment, and these high-risk features are being considered as perforation, obstruction, some people say uh, this thing, high CEA, which is preoperative, involved uh, LVI, that is lymphovascular or per, uh, neural involvement, and most important, whether the adequate lymph node dissection has been done or not. Sometimes some people also talk about poorly differentiated, uh, differentiated histology, that in the setting of the MSI high or MMR uh, deficient becomes in, uh, infructuous. So particularly looking through the evidence and the, the suggestion this particular patient does not require adjuvant chemotherapy. Next. Can you see the slide? So what essentially is needed for this particular patient is that we need to have a close follow-up. Yeah, I, I can see the slide. So, so I finished these two. Can we move on to the next one? Yeah, so the, the, the reason for not giving adjuvant chemotherapy in stage 2 patient is that based on the CR database, you see the prognosis of adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, prognosis of severe survival, they 
among the stage two category, whenever there is involvement of the either they, they cross the peritoneum, they involve the peritoneum, cross the uh, serosa, then the prognosis comes down. And the T4 is one category among the stage two where the adjuvant chemotherapy is indicated. Next one. So this probably I can talk in the same breath because like for the stage two, whenever there is a stage a node positive disease or high risk feature in the stage two, so we give adjuvant chemotherapy. Till a couple of months back, what we used to practice was that we should give the six months of adjuvant chemotherapy. And nowadays the standard is, I said earlier, oxaliplatin or capsitabin and capsitabin or oxaliplatin or uh, and 5 fu so now last two or three years, there's a lot of publication because oxaliplatin is one agent which gives a lot of neuropathy, whether we can, we can cut down the number of cycle or duration of the adjuvant chemotherapy in colon cancer. There was a large collaborative six randomized trial by IDEA group that is a and the uh, international uh, duration evaluation of adjuvant colon cancer chemotherapy. And they have come out and suggested that the Unless there is a very high risk, which is defined as the T4 or N2 histology, you can just give three months of adjuvant chemotherapy. Mainly, it should be the capsitabin based. So, adequate uh, evidence for the six, uh, three months of Volfox is not there. So, if you give oral capsitabin with oxaliplatin, three months of adjuvant treatment is considered uh, adequate. Next. I think uh, uh, we are finishing with the first case. So, the message from the first okay. That CA is important. Uh, we also understood what should be the staging protocol in these patients, non-rectal cases. And we also heard from Dr. Atul that most of the stage two will not require adjuvant chemotherapy, but then uh, stage three will require stage adjuvant chemotherapy. So now let's move to the second case. And this is a real multidisciplinary case because this was managed by gastroenterologists, went to radiation oncologists, then to surgical oncologists, and then back to medical oncologists. So this was a multidisciplinary approach. And this is a 58 years old male who presented to us with bleeding per rectum for five months with anorexia and a slight weight loss, known diabetic, known chronic obstructive airway disease. So I'm just telling you some of the important investigations. Sugar was high, his hemoglobin A1C was 7.4. He was switched from oral drugs to insulin. His hemoglobin was 10. Chest X-ray did show some evidence of five centimeters chest. Uh, unfortunately, I could not get an access to this colonoscopy and some of the investigations, but I'll uh, uh, outline it for you. Colonoscopy done in March 2019 at a hospital in Bhuvaneshwar showed a growth at eight centimeters from the anal verge, which was not possible. Internal hemorrhoids and a biopsy was no doubt adenocarcinoma. Uh, he also had a CECT scan and a PET scan done in Bhuvaneshwar, and they showed mild rectal, uh, small, mid rectal tumor, four centimeter long extent, eight centimeter from the anal verge. The thickness on PET scan was 2.8 centimeter with SUV maximum 14.8. Perirectal stranding was present, lymph nodes were present, both mesorectal and extra mesorectal, and distant metastasis was not there. Uh, we did an MRI uh, at that stage. Uh, in fact, the patient was carrying the MRI, which showed a length of tumor of 5.4 centimeter, wall thickness of 2.8 centimeters, periodical stranding was present, lymph nodes were present. CRM, which will be explained to you very soon, is circumference resection margin uh, was positive. That means the gap between the possible resection and the lateral extent of the tumor was more than two millimeter, less than less than two millimeter. The EMV one, that is extramural vascular invasion, was positive. There was not, obviously no fibrosis, patient has not received any chemotherapy. So this was stays as clinical stage T3, N2, M0, which will be stage three. So my question as to Ankur is, in this patient with a rectal tumor, can you tell us what will be the approach in terms of CT scan, MRI, EUS, or a PET scan? What should we do? Yes. So as we see, we have a lot of options on the table. So let's about talk about the advantages and limitations of each of these options. Endorectal ultrasound is done at very few centers. So very few centers have large volume experience in doing endorectal ultrasound. And the real utility of endorectal ultrasound is to differentiate the early lesions, that is for T1 and T2 lesions, which in our scenario is usually never the case. 
we see the earliest lesion we usually see is a T2 lesion. We hardly see any T1 lesions. So endorectal ultrasound is said to be more accurate than MR for T1 and T2 lesions. But then because of its operator dependency, limited field of view and lack of information, lack of comprehensive information about the local staging, so it is not much used. CT we have already seen, so for colonic masses, it is the investigation of choice and it has an essential role in the metastatic workup to look at liver, to look at lung and the retroperitone. However, for staging of rectal cancers, CT is inferior to MR. And this is problematic because we require an imaging investigation which has high accuracy for T staging, for prediction of the circumferential resection margin, and to tell about the involvement of the sphincter status. Thus, CT is not the ideal imaging investigation for evaluation of rectal tumors. The ideal investigation is MRI. So this is the investigation which should be used for local staging as well as for restaging of the rectal cancer after preoperative chemoradiotherapy. So whenever there is a mass on PR examination or a patient with a known anorectal mass, the usual protocol is do an MRI pelvis. One may go ahead and do a CT of chest, abdomen and pelvis for staging purposes. Some centers may, however, do a complete MRI abdomen pelvis with a CT chest for lung metastasis. So that is the protocol which should be followed for evaluation of rectal malignancy. PET CT again has no significant role in the initial staging. The only indications have already been delineated as in colonic CA whenever there are extensive mets or equivocal uh, nodules in the lung or liver on CT. However, in follow-up PET CT plays an important role, especially to localize the site of recurrence in patients who have rising serum CEA but non-diagnostic CT of chest and abdomen. As in this particular case, so there was presence of this ill-defined lytic lesion, which was just taken to be a simple bone cyst in the humerus, but it showed intense uptake, suggesting that this was a clear metastasis in a case of CRX. So these are how the acquisition of MR images is done. So we essentially used T2-weighted sequences, which are non-fat suppressed, and all the three planes acquisition is done. So the planning is done as per the axis of the tumor. So if it's a rectal tumor, the planning is done as per the axis of the rectum. If it is located in the anal canal, then we plan as per the axis of the anal canal. Another sequence, in addition to T2-weighted sequence, which is done is a diffusion-weighted sequence. And the last images in both the rows are the diffusion-weighted sequences. So tumor is expected to be high, to be hyper intense on the high B value image, as is seen in upper panel. And it will be dark on the ADC map as is seen in the last image on the lower panel. So I'll show you a few examples of how the different uh, stages of tumors look like. Can we go to the next slide? So we have already seen the staging. Important to note that in rectal cancers, it is important to differentiate T3 further based on how much it is extending outside the muscularis propria. So if it is less than 5 mm and greater than 5 mm is the big question which is involved. Next slide, please. So these are how the various tumors look like. In the first case, we can see that the dark line of muscularis propria is intact. So the tumor is not extending outside the propria. In the second case, we can see there is subtle irregularity on the border of the muscularis propria, which suggests that there is about a millimeter extension outside the propria. In the third case, it is more, especially in the six o'clock to nine o'clock position where the tumor is bulging out of the muscularis propria. In the fourth case, the extension is still more. It is 5 to 15 mm. And in the uh, lower panel, we can see the tumor is reaching up to the mesorectal fascia. T4 tumors will have infiltration of the adjacent structures. As is seen, the tumor is infiltrating the obturator internus muscle and then it is infiltrating the bladder. Can we move to the next slide, please? EMVR. This is a, also an important pointer and we need to mention in our reports because this is a very good predictor of local recurrence and poor survival in these cases. So as we can see at 9 o'clock position in this particular image, there is presence of an T2 intermediate signal intensity tumor which has a very tortuous kind of linear appearance which is going into the vein. So whenever the vein appears distended with this intermediate signal intensity tumor, this means there is extramural venous invasion although not included in the staging, but this portails a poor prognosis for the patient. 
circumferential resection margin. So this means we have to measure the shortest distance between the tumor and the mesorectal fascia corresponding to the non-peritonealized surface of the rectum. So if on imaging, tumor is reaching up to 1 mm of the mesorectal fascia, that means CRM is positive. This patient is likely to have positive resection margins after surgery. However, if the distance is more than 2 millimeters, one can safely think that this is negative CRM. So the resection margins are likely to be negative after surgery. So Dr. Anko, before uh, we proceed, uh, what MRI? We understand about the various stressor of MRI, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, So uh, are, does it matter that what type of machine you are using? And do you use contrast in all patients? So sir, as per the guidelines, the minimum strength of the MRI magnet should be 1.5 Tesla. So it can be either 1.5 or 3 Tesla, doesn't really matter. The endorectal coil is no longer used. We have phased array coils which are used, so no endorectal coil is to be used. Rectal distension is also not required. Some centers advocate that little bit of rectal distension using about 60 ml of uh, jelly can be used for very small lesions, otherwise no rectal distension is required. And regarding the sequences, so the main emphasis is on T2-weighted non-fat suppressed sequence. Whenever we are assessing after giving chemoradiotherapy, then diffusion-weighted sequence is also very important. Contrast has no indication in uh, evaluation of CA rectum. It is only investigational and only for response assessment after chemoradiotherapy. Thank you. I think uh, for the rectal tumor, it's very important for us to understand the concept of new adjuvant and adjuvant therapy. This is where it differs from the rest of the colonic tumors, from proximal, uh, from symbolic, descending, transverse, colon. And I think there, I think uh, the rectal tumor is entirely a different ball game compared to the rest of the colon. So my next question in reference to this case and otherwise to Dr. Atule is, what is the protocol for new adjuvant and adjuvant therapy in rectal tumors? And what we do advocate in this particular patient? All right, thank you again. So first at the foremost, basically, whenever we are talking about the rectal cancer, we need to clearly see the extent of the rectal tumor. So upper rectal cancer, which are just located up to the upper one third, they are treated more like the colon cancer. That means there is no strong evidence that these subjects should be getting neoadjuvant chemo radiation or chemotherapy alone. So when we talk about, however, if this is the upper rectal cancer that is coming down to the middle or involving the even lower third and this thing, they are treated like the rectal cancer and new adjuvant treatment becomes very paramount. Over the years, what we have learned is that the surgery and post-op radiation is better than the surgery alone. What also we have learned by various studies that if we give the surgery post-op radiation, along with the chemotherapy, then this is bit better than the surgery and post of RT. Essentially suggesting that there is an immense role for the chemotherapy as well. Whereas not discounting that the surgery and radiation are very, very important local treatment for any rectal cancer. From the German study, then subsequently from many other studies, now we have come to a stage we, we say that if you give neoadjuvant chemo radiation, it is better than the adjuvant chemo radiation alone, and there is a lot of data to back this statement. Nowadays, for the last few months or probably two or three years, we are also talking about in a select group of the patient whether you can deliver the all neoadjuvant treatment, all uh, systemic treatment and radiation before surgery. And this new concept is known as the total new adjuvant therapy and the data is emerging. We haven't started practice of that now. Move on to the next slide, please. So if you see the various guidelines, can we move on to the next? Yeah. So, so next, slide, next slide, I'll discuss the adjuvant subsequently. Let me finish the new adjuvant one. Next, next please. Next, please. Next, next. Please. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we have removed the desk. What we now did, so maybe we go there. Various guidelines suggest if there is a T1, 2, 3, or N1. So T1 or T2, N0, we just don't give new adjuvant treatment. They can be straight away taken up for the surgery. Any node positive disease, T1 to 3, with the CRM intact, then we can give either the 
short course radius set that means five days per, in a week and then couple of weeks later usually nowadays we prefer six to eight weeks later they can be taken off for the surgery if the crm is threatened or involved it is very important to give the new advent chemo radiation and take these subject for the surgery six to eight weeks later because that is the time when we get the maximum response to the uh, chemotherapy and radiation once undergone the surgery most of the people though the literature is probably not very clear about that but most of the people practice that they should be given systemic treatment to complete a total course of six months of the systemic treatment suppose you have given new adjuvant chemo radiation that forms about six to seven weeks of the treatment rest of the treatment to be given after the surgery so there is a metal analysis which suggests that the adjuvant chemotherapy after the preoperative chemo radiation may not improve the oral survival but it does improve the disease free survival next please so this is what probably i was this article talk about lancet oncology so this is about adjuvant and new adjuvant chemotherapy most of the centers i would again stress that after new adjuvant chemo radiation give adjuvant chemotherapy so as to complete total duration of 6 month of the chemotherapy thank you okay so let me come back to this case so she has diabetes so was started insulin required bronchodilators but as uh, discussed by dr atul we plan to give a chemo radiotherapy new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy uh, the patient was given capacitabin along with radiotherapy which was not the short cycle but the long cycle of 50 gray divided on 28 fractions over a period of about 5 weeks so as uh, dr atul discussed there were uh, there are a number of approaches in this situation this is the traditional approach of long chemo radiotherapy the other approach which can be given in some sub subset of people particularly the high rectal tumors and t3 disease is a short radiotherapy of only 5 days 5 gray every day and then going for a surgery within 1 to 2 weeks so there were the two these are the two approaches and maybe we can discuss that which is better for which patient subsequently so this is an mri which we did uh, after new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy and look at the difference this is april 19 and this is july 19 i'll be showing you the july 19 pictures But the length has decreased the length of the tumor decreased from 4 cm to 3.1 cm wall thickness decreased from 2.8 to 1.8 cm periodontal stranding disappeared lymph nodes disappeared crm which was uh, threatened was negative now emvi which was present was now negative and there was some evidence of fibrosis which came in because of the new adjuvant chemotherapy therapy so the staging tnm was t3 n2 m0 which is stage 3 to start with this is clinical staging and after new adjuvant therapy which is called y stage this was t2 n0 m0 so this was stage 2 disease so stage 3 disease was down stage to stage 2 by new adjuvant therapy t3 became t2 n2 became n0 and of course this was a m0 disease so this is uh, the this is the pictures of the mri done in july you can see in this scan that the, the, there is a wall thickness which is 1.4 to 1.8 cm there is a circumferential thickness in the lower part you can see the circumferential thickness here and this is how the tumor looked like uh, t2 m0 m0 so how do you judge this response dr ankur so evaluation of response after new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy so mri is the investigation of choice the evaluation is actually difficult because there are multiple confounding factors in this case we have seen that there is reduction in the tumor length reduction in the tumor diameter and now no nodes are visible no emvi is there so this as per the mr tumor response criteria this will be intermediate category of response because a good response is when there is no visible tumor and it's all replaced with fibrosis however in this particular case the residual tumor is still there so this will be an intermediate category of response so these are the problems in evaluation of the post ctrt imaging the edematous submucosa can be a confounding factor it can mask the residual tumor as in the first case in the second case we can see the thick hypo intense dark Uh, mucosal lining which is expected because of fibrosis 
the third and fourth images show that there is lot of submucosal T2 hyperintensity that is edema and lot of perirectal fat stranding with thickening of the mesorectal fascia. So if I am seeing this case de novo, it will be very difficult to say whether this is all radiation induced or is it all tumor which has infiltrated into the mesorectal fascia. So evaluation on MRI is difficult. However, since on pathology, there is a tumor regression grade. So similarly, a tumor regression grade is assigned on MR as well. The accuracy of this MRTRG is about 70 to 75%. So based on this, uh, whether the tumor is completely replaced with fibrosis or mucin or it is less than 50% replaced, one can grade the tumor response grade. So in the first image, we can see there is a lot of tumor which is residual on the diffusion weighted image, which can be seen as hyper intense. In the second image, we can see in addition to the residual tumor, there are enlarged lymph nodes as well. In the third uh, image, we can see that this was a mucinous neoplasm. So there is some hypo intensity that is fibrosis, especially from uh, nine o'clock to three o'clock position. In the last image, we can see there is some mucinous change in this previously non-mucinous tumor, especially from six o'clock to nine o'clock. And in the upper panel, we can see that there is a lot of residual tumor and we hardly see any fibrosis. So based on uh, MRI appearance, there is intermediate response in this particular case. So, uh, Dr. Ankur, uh, is there any role for PET scan uh, to pick up the changes? No, sir. I don't think there is any role of PET scan. PET scan is only for staging purposes. For local uh, staging, MRI will have the highest spatial resolution, which will be unmatched by PET scan. Uh, I was just talking about, I understand what you're saying, but I wanted to carry this message to everybody that even for response evaluation, between before pre-neoadjuvant and post-neoadjuvant, PET scan has no role. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, uh, this patient was now prepared for surgery and uh, uh, the surgery was done after that. But before we uh, tell us what surgery was done in this particular patient, let's hear from Dr. Rohit Mittal about what are the options for surgery in a rectal tumor. So, uh, options for surgery in a rectal tumor are slightly different from a uh, colonic tumor. Uh, and the main question in rectal tumors that most patients have is, will we need a stoma? And if we need a stoma, will it be temporary or will it be permanent? So, in low rectal tumors, most patients end up having a permanent stoma. And I think that is a major uh, worry that patients have. Now, the current slide that we are showing is what is called an anterior resection. For tumors in the upper and mid rectum, we can do anterior resection where we remove the sigmoid, part of the sigmoid and the upper and the mid rectum. We give a 2 centimeter distal margin of the tumor and remove the whole uh, rectum and the uh, sigmoid colon along with the mesorectum and the mesosigmoid right up to the origin of the inferior mesenteric artery where all the lymph nodes are. The tumor, the lymph nodes uh, and the lymphatics are all taken out in one package uh, and this procedure is called a total mesorectal excision. And it is very, very important that we do a total mesorectal excision because total mesorectal excision has been shown to reduce uh, local recurrence very, very drastically. Uh, now for low rectal tumors, we do something called an abdominoperineal excision where we have to remove the lower bit of the rectum and the anal canal also. So in this case, we, as we can see, right from the anal canal to the upper and the mid rectum and the distal sigmoid, everything is removed. The anal opening is actually closed. Um, and patient has to have a permanent stoma. This is usually done only for tumors of the distal rectum. Uh, now, this is a specimen of the anterior dissection. As you can see, we give a 2 centimeter distal margin, and the whole specimen is removed as one package with the mesorectal fascia intact, and this is called total mesorectal excision. If we breach the mesorectal fascia, then the chance of local recurrence increases, and the quality of surgery is very, very important in this case. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Sometimes when the patient is not fit, uh, we don't want to do an anastomosis. So what we do is we bring out a proximal stoma and leave the distal stump inside. We allow the patient to recover and finish the chemotherapy. And once they are better, we can do an anastomosis later. This is called an Hartman's operation. Uh, this is a temporary stoma. Uh, an APR is when we remove everything and uh, patient has to have a permanent colostomy. As you can see in this specimen, the whole colon has again been re removed. You can see at the end, there's a little bit of anal canal skin that has also been removed. Uh, and this is an APE, the patient has to have a permanent stoma. Uh, 
should we cover this now or should we cover this yes later? we can cover it now i think okay. so we've come a long way from uh, you know previously there was only very few options for active cancer and i will dwell a little bit on this slide because i think it's important to understand what options we have now uh, radiation has evolved uh, chemotherapy has evolved and surgery has evolved uh, evolved a lot and whereas see rectal cancer can be now divided into early the standard which is the you know the stage 2 and 3 the locally advanced which is like the 3a 3b and stage 4 and then the metastatic group and each of them the one in blue on top is what we used to do earlier and the one in sort of orange below is what new options we have for treatment so for the very early rectal cancers the t1 uh, lesion sometimes even t2 Uh, earlier what was there is the operation was the only sand, uh, operation so you you go and directly operate you do an anterior resection on apr but now for a subset of these groups we can do even better procedures we can do transanal excisions we can do transanal endoscopic microsurgery transanal minimally invasive surgery to just remove these lesions if they are n0 um, a new thing that is coming up and i'll show a few slides in that is combined laparoendoscopic surgery where gastroenterologists and surgeons uh, operate together and try and remove tumor Uh, and in a sub select sub group of these we can only give rt and try and see if the tumor responds completely and we don't operate at all and so patient avoids the stoma so that is for the very early tumors for the standard stage 2 uh, and stage 3 uh, the standard of care earlier used to be neoadjuvant radiotherapy followed by surgery but uh, as was mentioned uh, before also now total neoadjuvant therapy is coming up where we give chemotherapy and radiotherapy both up front with the hope that the tumor melts away and we may not need to operate the types of surgery has also improved we can do something called a transanal tme which improves outcomes in a select group for the apr we have a new type of apr called the extra levator apr uh, where the outcomes are better than the standard apr in select groups and in a very select sub group of patients sometimes if they have complete response what ankur had mentioned as you know a trg uh, uh, 1 where there is only fibrosis and no tumor and clinically there is no tumor left we may may not need to operate we just wait and we watch these patients and if they have a recurrence we operate and outcomes are not worse in those cases but this is only for a select group now for the advanced tumors earlier we used to either do excentration or we used to do only palliation but now much more is possible we can do something called a beyond tme resection where we take off bits and pieces which are involved or we can do pelvic excentration and patients do pretty well with that uh, in the metastatic group earlier you know sometimes liver resection was possible sometimes we would say nothing is possible now no patient has to be on supportive care only but now even multiple uh, mets to the liver uh, there are criteria for liver resection which is actually pretty common if there is metastasis to the lung we can do lung resections uh, we do about 3 or 4 a year in our center and peritoneal metastasis which was absolutely an indication for palliation when we you know when we were medical students they said if there is metastasis in the peritoneum patients have to go for palliation for low volume peritoneal disease we can do something called cyto reduction and intra peritoneal chemotherapy where we give chemotherapy during the operation in the peritoneum at 43 degrees and uh, outcomes are very good i mean in a select sub group of these patients the median survival actually improves to about 3 or 4 years whereas earlier it was months so there are a lot of options available depending on what stage the rectal cancer is and the key to this is actually staging which uh, was very nicely mentioned saying mri plus the ct chest so this is a slide where you can see a very very early uh, rectal cancer a low rectal cancer and we have just done a transanal excision in the early days this patient would have required a uh, ape with a permanent stoma now this is a patient where we have done a transanal minimally invasive surgery where we put a port in the rectum put a laparoscope inside and we can do full thickness resection of the rectum for t1 and some related t2 tumors also Uh, now this is something very exciting combined laparoendoscopic surgery we have not done one yet but if we do get a right case we are planning to do one so if this this is for polyp this is not for cancer or maybe early t1 cancer if there is a polyp or a cancer in the cecum um, the uh, you know gastroenterologists can show the scope and we can actually staple it across uh, uh, and uh, therefore no big surgery is required so that is what we can do so there are a lot of options um, and i hope i provided some clarity well, thank you dr Ro- rohin for giving us the overview of rectal malignancy surgery So uh, let's come back to this patient. Uh, last month, in August 2009, 20, sorry, uh, this uh, sorry 2019, uh, this patient had a low anterior resection and defunctioning ileostomy was done. This was a bulky disease, no lymphadenopathy, sigmoid colon and rectum was divided. End to end colorectal anastomosis is done with the stapler. A test was negative. He did undergo a defunctioning ileostomy because of poor bowel preparation. Developed post-operative sepsis, which was controlled, and the patient was discharged. This is a histology. The tumor size at histology was 4.9 into 3.5 into 1 centimeter. Tumor extension. It invaded the muscular papilla into the pericolorectal tissues. Histology: adenocarcinoma grade 2. Margins were clear. 
The distal margin was the closest margin, which was 1.7 millimeter. Lymphovascular invasion, perineular involvement was absent. Tumor budding was intermediate. Underlying polyp was not identified. And the 15 lymph nodes which were removed, including one at the origin of the internal inferior mesenteric artery, were all negative. So the scoring at surgery after new adjuvant therapy was T3 and 0. And these are some of the representative histology. You can see the tumor here. So uh, this patient, as discussed earlier by Dr. Atul, received adjuvant chemotherapy, KPOX, was our child, six cycles, till February 2020. He had a CCT abdomen, which showed no evidence of disease, a COVID negative. He also had an MRI, and then the ileostomy was closed last month, in July 20. Uh, now, question to Dr. Shais Kameta as to when will, how will you follow these patients in terms of colonoscopy on CEA? Uh, Dr. Mehta? Yes, sir. Uh, so, may I have the first slide? Um, I'd like to begin with uh, a non-advanced adenoma and stage one disease because this is ha this is what happens after you do not find anything on colonoscopy. So, uh, after the first follow-up, that is. Um, a non-advanced adenoma is one where the polyp is more than one centimeter. I'm sorry, it's less than one centimeter. It's villous adenoma. It's if there is high grade dysplasia and or high grade dysplasia. I'm sorry. This is this is an advanced adenoma where the polyp is more than one centimeter, villous adenoma, high grade dysplasia. In these patients, we will repeat a colonoscopy after three years, and then if there is it's negative, then we will repeat it at, at every five years. In stage one disease, you repeat it at one year, and then every three years. However, it's all uh, these strategies can be less intensive and may be preferred in different healthcare settings depending on the acceptable costs, available medical resources, and patient preferences also. When you have patients, next slide. Oh yeah. um, when you have patients who have stage two or stage three colorectal carcinoma and they have completed their entire colorectal cancer treatment protocol, then we divide the, then we can think about the follow-up in two ways, in the first two years and then between the three between three to five years. A history, physical examination, and CEA is performed every three to six monthly in the first two years. A CT scan is done every six to 12 monthly. In stage four disease, in patients who have undergone a metastectomy, we would reduce the duration of the follow-up to three to six months. And we would do a colonoscopy after one year uh, thereafter, we would follow the adenoma guidelines. If not done preoperatively, then the first colonoscopy is repeated at six months after completion of the treatment protocol. Once the patient has achieved the third year follow-up, he reaches that stage, then we can reduce the follow-up to six monthly with a CEA history and physical examination and a CT scan, which will be done every six to 12 monthly. I think uh, uh, Dr. Saista told us about the colonoscopy follow-up. Now, only one thing is that in the case two, uh, we could not complete a colonoscopy preoperatively. So we yes. depend on surgery was limited surgery. So in this situation, uh, when should we do the first colonoscopy? Three months to six months? No, sir. It should be done. The first colonoscopy, if the pre-op colonoscopy was incomplete, then the first colonoscopy is done at six months after completion of therapy. And if the pre-op colonoscopy, pre-operatively the colonoscopy was complete, then the first colonoscopy is done at one year. So in this patient, right. we'll do it at six months. All right. So that's a very important message that in the first case which we presented, a repeat colonoscopy may be required after one year, whereas the second case which we present the rectal tumor where the pre-operative colonoscopy could not be done, I think the first colonoscopy should be done within six months. That's a very important message that you don't miss a synchronous lesion uh, while you are waiting. So I think we have a we had a surprise in this second case. Uh, don't ask me why, but a CT scan was done almost at the time when the ileostomy was closed. And to our surprise, we found that's why PET scan, PET CT. And to our surprise, we found two pulmonary nodules. You can see this one on the anterior and the posterior segments, small nodules which was PET avid. So you can see that uh, they are positive for PET. So that brings us to a metastatic disease in the same patient during the follow-up after receiving both new adjuvant and adjuvant chemoradiotherapy. So what should we do? Should we observe for these small nodules? Should we biopsy them? Or should we start the treatment? Uh, Dr. Rohit, or Dr. Ankur, anybody can answer that question. 
Uh, just tell me whether we should observe biopsy or treat. Dr. Shaisna? I think so. We should treat this. Or you, will you biopsy them or you will you treat them straightforward? So, so this is treat. this is a question that is very, uh, I mean, it's dependent on the person. It's on individual practice. Because the PET scan is so classical and the CT also is classical, we would go ahead with a resection. In case the patient is not fit and we are planning an RFA, that's non-reception, non-surgical non treatment, then we would think of doing an FNA. So the, what should be the treatment? Should we upfront do a surgery or should we first do a, 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 a therapy, a chemical, a chemical a systemic therapy? So Dr. Rohin, will you go for a surgery in this situation first or will you give a therapy first? So in a situation when there is metastatic disease, the few considerations that I would have is one, how fast the metastasis has appeared. And in this case, the time duration between appearance of metastasis and completion of chemotherapy is very short. So almost as soon as the chemotherapy is finished, we found it. So that is a very uh, you know, red flag marker saying this is not a good biology disease. Uh, second thing uh, we would say is uh, depending on where the location is, is it uh, imminently operable or is it you know sort of borderline operable? And that is what makes a decision of whether we should give chemotherapy or not. In this particular case, um, I would be wary of operating first because these uh, lesions have developed while on chemotherapy. So this is bad biology disease and it may you know, we may find multiple other nodules in the short time. So what we would, I would personally so discuss it in the multidisciplinary team and then probably end up giving some chemotherapy, seeing the response. And if there are no new lesions that come up, we will offer him surgery after maybe three cycles of chemotherapy. Uh, but we would not offer surgery upfront. We well, already discussed that the future, uh, the liver resection, lung resection, and the uh, hypec therapy. Okay, so uh, so that was for this patient. Now, when uh, I'll when you go back to the previous slide, I'll just go through a few uh, things. Uh, so. In metastatic disease, I think what we need to find is whether there is oligometastasis or generalized metastasis. If there is multiple organ metastasis and the patient takes a palliative route and goes to down the chemotherapy route, whereas if there is liver only, lung only, or peritoneum only, then curative options are still possible. In liver, if it is you know on one side of the liver, if there are few lesions, less than four or five lesions, then we can do liver resection, we can do RFA, uh, options are there, and we still treat with curative intent. Uh, like in this patient, if there is lung, which is only on one side, few nodules, we can still treat with curative intent. Uh, and in peritoneum, if there is low volume disease, we have uh, something called a peritoneal carcinomatosis index. And if it is like less than 10 or 12 on the CT scan, then we can offer them something called cytoreduction and hypec, where we remove all the peritoneum, we remove every single organ that is involved. This is one case that we have done. We've removed the uterus, the cervix, the vagina, along with the colon. We did right hemicolectomy also for this patient and the peritoneum. And the next picture, you can see that we've sort of made a chamber in the abdomen and we give an intraoperative chemotherapy. Um, and these patients have a fairly good survival with a median survival of about 42 months after this. Whereas without this operation, the survival will be less than a year. So in select people where there is peritoneal disease with even, you know, uh, omental disease, we can do an operation. Can we go to the next slide? So, uh, okay, so this is wait and watch. Now, if we find after response, after radio, neoadjuvant radiotherapy, there is no lesion left. Sometimes the patient will come back and we'll do a rectal examination. There'll be nothing left. All the tumor has disappeared. In those patients, in a subgroup, there is an option called watch and wait, where we watch and we wait and we don't operate because all the tumor has gone away. And the criteria for that is clinically, there should be no tumor left. MRI wise, there should be no tumor left. And Ankur uh, showed a very good uh, uh, MRI where you know there's only fibrosis and no tumor left. And on endoscopy, there should be no tumor left. And I think uh, as gastroenterology, somebody was mentioning that more and more people like this are getting referred to look at saying, what should we find on scopy when there's no tumor left? And the criteria is that at the site of the previous tumor, so here's a slide where we can see that there was a tumor there. This is post radiotherapy. At the site of the tumor, there should be only scar, there should be whitening, and there may be some telangiectasia. But there should be no nodules, no ulcers, no polyp or no growth to call it complete response for wait and watch. Uh, a biopsy of this is not recommended because there's a very high false uh, negative rate because you don't know which area to biopsy. Uh, but if we don't find any uh, nodules, ulcers or polyp and there's only scar and telangiectasia, then this patient may be suitable for uh, non-operative management depending on the MRI and the clinical findings. Chances are, uh, Rohin, is that uh, uh, if you do a wait and watch approach, you may land up in more trouble sometime later on, isn't it? Absolutely. So it is not for everybody. 
it is for a very select subgroup of patients who have good biology in the beginning who have good response are you know sort of willing for very rigorous follow up uh, and have no bad prognostic features so signet ring cell mucinous tumors uh, lymph, extensive lymph nodal metastasis all the all of them are excluded but in a very select subgroup of patients they can avoid a permanent stoma but this is uh, very, very selective i must reiterate you have to be very very selective okay uh, atul um, so it seems that there is a consensus that this patient should not be operated because it looks biologically uh, difficult tumor so what therapy from your side you will offer in this situation so uh, probably i will have a little difference of the opinion the very fact that this patient gentleman had relapsed and progressed while almost on treatment or within 6 months of the treatment suggests a different poor biology of course he has and also at the same time that the what was the chemotherapy this person received wasn't wasn't be wasn't able to contain the disease so that means he is not responding to the treatment chemotherapy so suggesting taking that into account possible i would discuss with our thoracic surgeon and of course the ct scan and pet uh, ct scan has been done suggest there's two small nodule and which i believe the surgeon will be easily able to take them out so my probably take will be that which he should undergo surgical resection if the surgery by any means not possible either the comorbidity or patient doesn't want is this thing then the local treatment in the form of sbrt or effective therapy and then this optimal treatment that probably you doing it then right so here is that probably there are the three important that this person has already received five vetu and oxaliplatin so only that left in is not taken so be used to probably can in not take the can based chemotherapy for that six month of surgery given and that's it in case by any means no local treatment is considered case we need to give systemic treatment then i will also do at the same time some molecular analysis to suggest what are the best option for him whether this person is suitable for the egfr inhibitors or not and the two egfr inhibitors in practice as one is the penetimumab and second is the cetuximab both almost have the similar efficacy the only problem with the egfr is that there is some thing called at the predictive and prognostic marker for the egfr inhibitor and the predictive marker is the res so if you have the n res and k res mutates in any of the exon suggest that these patient are not suitable for the egfr inhibitor and possibly we need to use the bevacizumab which is a vegf inhibitor or vegf receptor inhibitor these are the so so concept is very approach difference yes yeah, sorry sorry carry on so regard i could probably just finish the metastatic part so concept in metastatic colorectal cancer nowadays is that because the median survival used to be 6 months is in close to 30 months now and in occasional cases basically it probably about 40 more than 40 month also also we also subject these patient what is known as the msi or mmr so whether they have deficient mismatch repair protein or msi high then these patient are also candidate for the immuno oncology drug and we have very very good responses to that these drugs nowadays sorry please go ahead Uh, so is there any difference in the approach with the left sided tumor and the right sided tumor so far as the biologics are concerned yeah so 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 for the if the tumor is located on the left side they consider to have a better prognosis as such and these are the subjects if they have the wild type rest then probably they respond well to the this thing cetuximab or penetumab based treatment and the survival may be 3 3 years or little over 3 years of this thing EGFR inhibitor unfortunately now we know that they don't work on the right side tumor we are losing the video audio in between so what i'm saying that for the left side tumor they have yeah, we heard that we heard that yeah. so EGFR inhibitor unfortunately do not work well in the right side tumor so in the first line setting usually we don't give the EGFR inhibitors if the tumor is located on the right side and have metastatic disease you can use in the subsequent line but not in the first line 
So, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Atul. I think what we did in this case is that we are still waiting to make a decision. We will meet again. We have offered them all. Uh, the relatives, I think, are a very important part of this discussion. And we have given them all the options. And it seems that they are going to us the RFA, a local tumor, uh, being done along and then follow up with some form of systemic therapy. We have talked to the surgeons also. But then the point is that we do a surgery now and that it's a bad uh, disease tumor. And there may be more lesions which may come in. So... Uh, at this moment, what we seem to be doing in this particular patient is doing an RFA, local resection, and then a local uh, th ablative therapy, and then go for systemic therapy. Now, let me quickly move to the other spectrum, a case three. I'll just take two or three minutes to discuss this case. So this is a, a middle-aged man who presented to us with intestinal obstruction. You can see a large colonic dilatation in this case, and there's a cutoff point here. This patient underwent a colonoscopy and we found a polypoidal ulcerated tumor. Uh, he was not, could not be prepared properly and we put a stent in this patient. Uh, this is the stent which has been put. So the question, and this is how it looked like after the stent was placed. Now the question is that for obstructive tumor, tumor presenting with obstruction, what should be the option? Stent, colostomy or resection? Dr. Saiz Tamehata, please. Uh, Mahesh, just to interrupt, I think uh, some of us are not seeing your slides. Uh, could you just uh, move them forward? We didn't see the tumor. Can you see the slide now? Yeah. Yes. So just just please go over that again. Two minutes more is no problem. But now right, we so this slides, is, so we'll understand yeah, what you're yeah. telling us. So this is a middle-aged man who presented to us with acute intestinal obstruction. This is the abdominal X-ray showing multiple air fluid levels. The CT scan showing grossly dilated colon with a tumor here. So you can see that this is the picture of CT scan. Uh, is the video seen there? So is yeah, the video yeah, we see the X-rays. We see the X-rays. So if you could move on to the video now. I'm, I'm the video. Yeah, so the video is yeah. seen. There's a tumor there. And uh, we decided to put a stent. Uh, can you see the stent there? And this is the stent picture. Yes. And right. this is how it looked after uh, the stent was placed. Uh, we evaluated the tumor was localized to the wall and uh, a subsequent treatment was a surgical approach in this case. So the question to surgeon and the gastroenterologist is whether you will stent, do a colostomy, or do a one-stage resection. Uh, let me first ask Saista. So, so data, may I have the first slide? Uh, so data is regarding stenting versus emergency colostomy as a bridge to surgery. Now we have a systematic review and a meta-analysis in the World Journal of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy in 2019. It says that SEMS is considered to be superior because of lower rate of a temporary and a permanent stoma lower short-term morbidity and better quality of life. Uh, but we don't know about its long-term effects, particularly its oncological safety, because if you land up with perforations or any other complication, then whether this would lead to seedlings is something that still needs to be answered. Uh, however, in the palliative uh, setting, this is a bridge to surgery, but in the palliative setting, I have one more slide. Uh, it's quite clear that with a systematic review and meta-analysis of 2018, that the mortality, mean, uh, mean survival, length of stay in the ICU, and early complications are equivalent in both the methods. So people today are preferring SEMS over uh, getting a stoma done. Uh, Dr. Rohi, you will agree with this? Uh, you have different opinion there. So I think, by and large, I agree. I think when we put a stent, the first question to ask is, are we doing this as a palliative intent? Or are we doing it with a bridge to surgery? If you're doing it with a palliative intent, uh, if the patient is sick, definitely stent is the way to go because the risk of anesthesia is very, very high. Uh, sometimes patients don't want a stoma. Therefore, a stent is the way to go if uh, technically possible. Some of the low-rectal tumors, a stent is not possible. But if it is possible, a stent is definitely a much better palliative option. Keeping in mind that there is a risk of tumor perforation. And in a sick patient who is old and debilitated, if there's a tumor perforation, we may not be able to offer an operative intervention. But a stent is definitely beneficial in the palliative setting. In a curative setting, um, I think a, st uh, a stent offers a very good bridge to surgery where you tied over the obstruction. And as uh, Professor Sesta has pointed out, we have lower stoma rates. Uh, but 
at the same time there's a high perforation rate in these patients so in a in a fit patient if there's a 45 year old who comes with an obstructed tumor uh, i would go in for surgery whereas in slightly older patients or in patients who are very very sick uh, we, i would go in for a stent so are you worried about bowel preparation when you go for a single stage procedure yes so for for most of the left colonic tumors no for the uh, sigmoid and the rectal tumors yes uh, the bowel will be uh, full of stools and not prepared we can do something called an on table lavage in these patients where we sort of milk out the stools and clean the colon and do an anastomosis very often these patients will end up having a temporary ileostomy which will be closed later so uh, advantage of the stent there is if stentable is that it avoids a temporary stoma Question I would for like you. to add uh, something here. Yeah, sure. In the palliative setting, one thing that we should be alerted as gastroenterologists is that we should avoid sto- uh, stenting if patients have a lot of peritoneal disease and ascites. We have seen stents repeatedly fail because they develop obstruction proximal to the stenting. Yes. And uh, the life uh, of such stenting is very short, up to about four weeks or six weeks, and then they eventually progress. So, if they get a stoma or an ileostomy up front, if they have peritoneal mets, I think it would be a wiser option than putting in a stoma. Do you prefer a covered stent or uncovered stent? We would put an uncovered stent, so we would okay. put a covered. I'm going to quick question to you: When a patient comes with intestinal obstruction like this, is CT scan compromised at that time to stage the disease? No, sir. I don't think the CT scan is compromised. because the bowel dilatation due to the obstruction serves as the inherent uh, contrast to tell us what is the transition point so we need don't need to give any oral contrast in cases of acute obstruction we just inject iv contrast and do the acquisition okay very top, very important point now um, i think the last 5 to 7 minutes i will spend on trying to make an algorithm let me first say that next four slides are very basic slides A hardcore and oncologist may not like it because there are many ifs and buts in these slides. But I think we need to have a general outlook for our approach to colorectal cancer, and I made it as simple as possible at the expense of being some, somewhat uh, not correct in all these issues. So, how do we approach a colonic cancer, which is non-rectal cancer? And as we discussed, there are two different diseases. Uh, rectal cancer is a different disease compared to the rest of the colon. So, let me first talk about algorithm for colonic cancer. so you suspect a colonic cancer you do a colonoscopy you stage the disease and as anku rightly said for a tumor which is proximal to the rectum a good ct scan uh, both abdomen pelvis and if possible a ct chest would give you a good staging both uh, stage as well as dnm staging so it can be 0 1 2 3 or 4 stage for zero stage there may be a role for endoscopy by either uh, endoscopic sub equal to the dissection or emr we purposefully avoided discussing on this because of so we've lost audio a different chapter altogether some of the st- can you hear my audio yes uh okay so uh, let me tell you for the stage 0 disease endoscopy early stage 1 the t2 t1 again endoscopy for stage 2 it will be surgery stage 3 of course will be surgery so in stage 3 all patients should receive adjuvant chemotherapy for stage 2 it should be only selection of people and this is selected by poorly differentiated tumor lymphovascular perineural invasion positive margin less than 12 lymph nodes resected or removed and patient who has presented with obstruction or localized perforation all these should receive adjuvant chemotherapy in stage 2 rest of the patient in stage 2 there is no option uh, for no 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 need to give a uh, adjuvant chemotherapy to these patients for stage 3 surgery should be followed by adjuvant chemotherapy and we also discussed a uh, 3 months versus 6 months of therapy for this now when we come to rectal cancer what's the difference again we should try to do a full length colonoscopy stage but there it should not damn sorry about this this should be an mri rather than ct scan again for early stage it can be either endoscopy or a trans anal surgery for stage 2 and stage 3 new adjuvant therapy in most of the cases though we understand that for early t3 t3a and t3b there is no need for new adjuvant therapy although it's a stage 2 disease 
Similarly, some of the stage one will also require you adjuvant therapy, say a patient who has extra mass, extra mural vascular involvement. But in general, stage two and stage three should receive new adjuvant therapy and followed by adjuvant therapy. We also discussed the two types of new adjuvant therapy, which has in practice. One is a short term radiotherapy, which is five gray every day for five days and then operating within one to two weeks. And second is a traditional long chemo radiotherapy in which we will spend uh, uh, about five weeks giving 28 fractions of 5,000 gray and then after a gap of five to 12 weeks do a surgery. So here the gap is more when you are doing a traditional uh, chemo radiotherapy, whereas in short radiotherapy, you should operate within one to two weeks and then of course uh, do an adjuvant chemotherapy. So metastatic colonic cancer we discussed, but if the primary is not operable, then palliative therapy, if primary or operable, then we discussed whether it's oligometastasis or extensive metastasis. In oligometastasis, you may go for resection or ablation, or for extensive metastasis, you should go for systemic therapy. And if you are fortunate that it becomes uh, oligo after giving systemic therapy, you can consider giving resection or ablation. Uh, I must tell you that these are very, very generalized uh, concepts which I'm putting to you. But then colorectal cancer today is a personalized treatment. And we not only look at the stage, we look at the behavior of the tumor, the genetic analysis, the age of the patient, what do the patient expect from us, the functionality of the residual tumor and all those. So what is a metastatic uh, therapy, systemic therapy? Uh, Dr. Atul uh, gave you an overview. So just to take home message, there are four types of therapy for systemic therapy for metastatic CRC. One is chemotherapies, which can be fluoroacyl. The one which is preferred now is capacitabin or oxaliplatin or iodinotectican. And you usually combine either two or three of them. Biologics are basically of two types, NT-VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor receptor antagonists, and NT-EGFR, epidermal growth factor with the receptor antagonists. So these are the two drugs which are commonly used, and there are other drugs also. Then there are salvage drug therapy, which basically is rigorafibin and TAS-102. And then we had targeted therapy, which includes immunotherapy, and these are the two drugs and BRAF plus ME, MEK inhibitors. So how do we start? We usually start with two or three of chemotherapy with one biologics, depending on the left or the right, or the RS mutation, you choose it. If they do not work, so this is our first line of therapy. If it does not work, then you can, in resistant cases, go for salvage therapy. And in specific patients with those who have genetic uh, requirement, like DMMR, or we discussed about MSI high, there you can go for immunotherapy, and a particular type of genetic mutation, BAF P600E, you can go for BAF plus, uh, plus MEK inhibitors. Now, uh, as I said, you start with usually two chemotherapy and one biologics, and then depending on the response, you might either down, downgrade the treatment or you may change to the other group of therapy, which are the resistance therapy or immunotherapy. This change may take place at any time during the follow up and will depend on the behavior, response, and the genetic analysis of the patient. Uh, so to conclude, I think uh, like many cancers of GI tract, almost all, this is a multidisciplinary management which is required. I think we need to have tumor boards, whatever you call them in your hospital, and each case should be discussed between the gastroenterologist, medical oncologist, and surgical oncologist, radiologist, and pathologist play a very, very important role in the management of these cases. So that's my take home message for all of you. Thank you very much. I think we will pick up between me and the panelists any questions if they come up. Dr. Vivek. Well, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Goenka, I must uh, say, it's been a very comprehensive and a very thorough coverage. Although we took only about three cases, but I think almost all aspects that uh, most gastroenterologists encounter uh, during their experiences with colorectal carcinoma were covered. Uh, we do have a few questions, about four or five questions, which I'd like to put uh, on behalf of the audience uh, to the panelists and uh, um, request for a brief to the point responses. Uh, Dr. S.K. Sharma from New Delhi has, wants to know whether all tumor samples should be subjected to KRAS or MMR, MM, MSI, MMR uh, mutation studies uh, to decide about uh, adjuvant therapy. So maybe Dr. Atul can answer that question. Atul? Atul, I don't see him here. So, yeah. So, I think, uh, which is, uh, uh, will Saista want to take up that question or Rohit? Uh, yes. Uh, so, 
The question is whether you should do genetic analysis and all, whether it is cost effective, uh, whether it should be just a research tool or should we do in all patients. Like in my first case, was it required? So like in your first case, sir, if routinely doing RAS mutations is, it's in some institutes, we are practicing that we do RAS mutations on, on the primary tumor. But eventually, that is not used for guiding any kind of adjuvant therapy. Uh, RAS mutations are required when we are treating metastatic disease and advanced tumors. So if you have a patient, in, like our first case, we wouldn't recommend doing a RAS mutation in all patients. Right. So selected in selected patients, you do RAS mutations and generally... In selected patients, upfront, advanced cases. Yes. Second stage therapy. Yes, right. where you consider, where you would consider... Uh, that you may have to offer biologicals. So only right. metastatic disease where we offer biologicals, we do RAS mutations. Uh, but I think the other situation could be somewhere when the polyposis syndromes. When you are dealing with polyposis syndrome, you want to know what are the what are the genetic mutations which are there. Yeah. So that is a different scenario. But yes, agree. Yes. Okay. Uh, so okay, uh, Dr. Rohin, I think uh, you could address this. I mean, Dr. Uh, Khandelwal from Katak wants to know precisely what is the role of HIPEC. And could you just elaborate and explain that a bit in a couple of minutes, in a couple of yeah. quick sentences, so, please? Uh, HIPEC is a relatively new technique where we remove uh, disease from the peritoneum. So, omental involvement, peritoneal involvement, if there's a little bit of tumor on the spleen, if there's tumor on the colon, whatever we can remove, we can remove. So, it is called cytoreductive surgery, where all the involved parts of the uh, abdomen can be removed. Now, it is possible in a select subgroup of patients. And how do we select these patients? One, they should have a low volume of tumor. So it is called colorectal peritoneal metastasis rather than carcinomatosis. Somebody who comes with widespread ascites or a tummy full of fluid is not suitable for this. So we in, uh, measure this by something called peritoneal carcinomatosis index. And usually up to 12 or 13 is what we take. So if they have a bit of tumor here and a bit of tumor here, we measure the size of tumor everywhere and we develop this index. Second thing is they should all have tumor in places where it is resectable. So if the tumor is at the porta, or if the tumor is on the stomach, or if the tumor is uh, uh, in the mesentery of the small bowel, these are areas we can't resect. So then we cannot offer this surgery. So in few patients where there is limited volume tumor in areas which we can resect, we can offer what is called cytoreduction. For somebody like what uh, Dr. Kandelwal has mentioned, who has got poor response to surgery and poor response to adjuvant chemotherapy and has widespread disease, we may not be able to offer it. Right. So what proportion, generally in your practice, how often do you uh, practice HIPEC? So, uh, well, uh, we we have a lot of patients. I, we do about one per month. Uh, uh, maybe, let's say, for every five or six patients, uh, or seven patients that come, only one will be suitable for it. Most of them will not be suitable. Right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ankur, I think you mentioned about the role of endosono for very early tumors. So, uh, I think there's a question from Dr. Nikhilesh in Hyderabad. That is the US mandatory for differentiating carcinoma in C2 and T1 adenomas as the endoscopic management may differ. So, uh, what are your thoughts on that? And maybe Mahesh can chip in and uh, give his views. So, if expertise is there, there's no harm in doing the EUS. One may be able to tell that yes, this is a T1 or T2. But I really don't think we would be able to diagnose the carcinoma in C2 lesions. I don't. I think uh, I think we descend, depend a lot on chromo endoscopy nowadays for uh, deciding this uh, disease, and uh, we don't do US on a routine. In fact, rectal uh, US is now becoming less and less popular with the MRI, which is becoming very very informative. So I think uh, rectal US we hardly practice nowadays. Right. Thank you. And uh, Doctor uh, Sharad Dev from Varanasi wants to know how does colon cancer in the young differ from that in older patients with respect to etiology, prognosis, uh, general behavior of the disease? Would one of you want to address that? Uh, Saista, would you like to answer that? Sir, can, can they repeat the question? Young, young CRC compared to elderly CRC. Young CRC, how does it differ? Cancer in the young versus in older patients. So what we find is that patients, uh, we see a lot, in India at least, we, see, we have seen a lot of rectal versus colon. And in young patients also, this this uh, this thing continues. This pattern remains. We see more rectum in the young than in um, than colon in the young. Now, where treatment protocols are concerned, the protocols do not differ based on young or old, except where we think of giving adjuvant chemotherapy. If the patient is extremely old, more than seventy years of age, and um, 
So we do not, we may avoid giving uh, adjuvant chemotherapy in certain settings. Otherwise, we, we, the protocols remain the same throughout. Okay. So I can add to that, basically the only other difference we found from young patients usually they many times have the poor histology and the signet ring cell is one of the histology which is considered. So we don't yes. change the treatment based on that, but they have the higher chance or have a higher incidence of having a signet ring morphology. So that probably that itself confers some kind of the poor risk. So we have some experience with that. And what we find is like Dr. Atul said, there's more signet ring histology and there's more poorly differentiated tumors in the young. But in our own series, what we have found is stage for stage, there is no difference in outcome. But overall, a large proportion of the younger patients are in advanced stages. So overall, if you look at all young patients, they have a poorer prognosis because they present as an advanced stage because we don't recognize it early. But for stage, there is no difference in uh, outcomes. One, just one line from my side, Vivek, that uh, one epidemiological uh, finding is that the young CRC are increasing relatively. And in the next few years, we'll see more and more young people and they would have more rectal tumors and more left-sided tumors. 140% increase in incidence of uh, young rectal cancers. Oh. So, so there is a publication from TMH where we have analyzed our data. It's an Indian Journal, Indian Journal of Surgical Oncology. And our age group for cancers is predominantly between the age of 29 to 50 years. It's very alarming. Same, same thing. So, so screening protocols which, which are followed in the West for early diagnosis do not apply to our country. I think it's been a very comprehensive and a very clear um, presentation about colorectal cancer. And I think the uh, clarity of the just is, uh, clarity of the presentations is testified to by the fact that we really haven't had too many uh, questions uh, from the participants, so because most aspects have been well covered. I think I'll uh, hand over the mic to Dr. Govind Makaria now to uh, bring us to the end of this session and uh, please go through. Uh, thank you so very much for, again, yet uh, one other uh, panel discussion on colorectal cancer. I think it quite have been learning experience, learning that uh, uh, the age of cancer is coming down in our country and we should be cautious about it. Your audio is a problem, Govind. Yeah, voice is created off. Can you just get closer to the mic, please? So, uh, yes, hope, uh, so, so uh, yeah. thank you again, everyone, for a wonderful masterclass on colorectal cancer. Uh, we know this is an important disease and it requires a multimodal treatment, which have been de uh, depicted very nicely by uh, three cases and uh, discussion over the last almost uh, 90 minutes. So, as we said earlier, that uh, uh, this will be a last in the series of first uh, round of master classes. Uh, what we started uh, uh, in the month of uh, April, because in March and April, all the because of lockdown, the academics were suspended. Uh, we thought uh, there will not be any training uh, in all the DM DNB centers. We thought, why not we create uh, online master classes? Uh, therefore, we thought that why let's have a ISU master classes at that point of time. And we started our first master class uh, on 16th of April, and we started with the two master class per week, Wednesday and Saturday. We expected that there will be uh, about 500 to 700 participants, but to our surprise, uh, the, our master classes uh, attendance was uh, varying from 1500 to 2000, and that was a big encouragement. And therefore, uh, we have a we have a viewers who were not only students or trainees. Uh, they were senior gastroenterologists, uh, 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 including many, many seniors and our teachers to participate. So therefore, uh, we uh, covered all the major topics in gastroenterology over the last almost six months. And uh, in gastroenterology, in hepatology, and some in endoscopy, all major topics uh, covered. And, 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 and uh, so after this recovery of major topics, we also realized that treatment of uh, GI cancer in our country, uh, maybe in all over the world, is not uh, uh, is is not properly because the, most institutions don't have a uh, tumor boards. What we give is uh, our individual practice uh, treatment to these patients, and we thought, why not we have this is a beautiful platform to highlight uh, the importance of multimodality treatment in gastrointestinal and pancreatic biliary tumors, and therefore we did seven master classes uh, on different. Uh, uh, gastrointestinal and uh, pancreatic biliary tumors in GI lymphoma, gallbladder, cholangiac carcinoma, and all have been really, really fantastic learning experience for all of us. 
So with this, uh, audio was good till now. Uh, we had been 500, 600 participants uh, uh, per master class. So overall, we had almost uh, 30,000 people saw all these master classes, about 1,000 uh, per master class. We also had participants from uh, different other countries, uh, which was a surprise to us. And, uh, and, and we had a participant for almost uh, uh, 27 countries uh, in various master classes. So this was a big surprise and uh, a good note for uh, our society. Furthermore, uh, there were two other important features uh, which was brought out in these master classes. That uh, whenever we have a topic in any conference, we don't have time for questions. And again, this topic delivered, no discussion done. So here we always kept uh, at least 20 minutes for question and answer sessions. And we had a mini master classes. We had 400 questions from participants, 400 questions. And we could take up only 15, 20 questions or 30 questions at best. So what we did, and, and this is again idea of Dr. Saraswat, that why don't we send these questions to the, the speaker? And, and many speakers, many speakers wrote back answers and to, to these questions which are left unanswered during panel discussion, and they were posted on the website. So one can, the, all the viewers could see the responses of the speaker on many questions which are not discussed in the masterclass. Second was, once we have any lecture, there's no memory, there's no, no, not memory, there's no, we can't see it again. So we thought, uh, why not we create a library of all these uh, wonderfully executed master classes and make it available uh, for, for the viewers uh, for many, many months or years to come. And therefore, uh, we make this library recorded videos and we put them to multiple sources. We have uh, ISG library. This is our own website, which is called isg.org.in. And if you find on the main page itself, ISG library and each masterclass is archived there. We have a Facebook page, so one can look at Facebook page of ISG and then we can access these uh, uh, these uh, uh, recorded videos on your phone. You can also access uh, the YouTube page of uh, Indian Society of Gastroenterology and look at uh, all these uh, uh, masterclasses. And we also have a page on Twitter if you want to use Twitter account of, to view these masterclasses. And, uh, Again, to look at the beauty of that, that are doing so, many, many people saw these this, uh, uh, master classes or recorded videos on Facebook and the number varying from all, up to up to 8,000. Uh, oh, sorry, YouTube varying from 4,000 uh, to uh, almost 500 people saw uh, the recorded videos later on after uh, the master class was over. And this is, numbers are still increasing. They're all available on YouTube. And Facebook, uh, people visualize the pages may not be the whole recorded video seen by them, but up to 8,000 or 9,000 videos were seen on Facebook. So with this have been a wonderful experience for all of us. And we know that for last about uh, uh, almost six months, every Sunday, we glued uh, to, to the online classes, to our laptops or phones. Uh, thank you so very much, everyone. Thank you, every viewer of these master classes, both from India and from abroad. Uh, thank you, each faculty member. They have been wonderful in pre preparing the state of art lectures because our our purpose was to improve practice, and or if each each and every speaker brought the practice point that what are the best practices in gastroenterology uh, in specific topic, and that would be that what would practice. Uh, we want to thank uh, each and member of IES uh, Inside Gastroenterology, all the trainees, uh, DM DNA trainees, uh, all uh, in our country. We want to thank the Governing Council of ISC who supported this activity uh, and allowed this activity to happen. And, and we also want to thank uh, the Bangladesh uh, Hepatology Forum. Overall, personally, I want to thank uh, Dr. Saraswat, uh, Vivek Saraswat, uh, the president of ISC. He has been constant uh, support every time. And you must have seen that every masterclass, I was absent two times uh, in the masterclass, but he was present in all 31 masterclasses continuously. So, the, and, and many of these ideas came like making library, making questions to speakers, all is ideas and which probably resulted in a good experience for all of us. A good experience in terms of a network between, uh, between the members and also a point of view of education and practice change. We want to thank uh, uh, the academic partners or support came from Sun Pharma, 
Dr. Reddy's lab, uh, Torrent Pharmaceuticals, and uh, last seven by uh, Lupin. Thank you, each one of you, very much for supporting this cause of uh, uh, Indian cytoplasmatology. We had a uh, uh, technical support, or all the all the webcasts have been done by Dinesh uh, from Digital Infomedia, and he had been. Uh, let me let us tell that he has been a wonderful uh, technical person, support each master class. And if I can introduce all of you, he the person who webcast all our T20 or IPL cricket matches. So he's the person who who relays on on the, on social media. So he's that kind of a technical support. Thank you, Dinesh, for a wonderful support always. Uh, and we want to thank uh, Yogita Joshi. Yogita Joshi is uh, uh, a secretary assistant at uh, Indian Surgical Centrology. She had done all the uh, coordination work for uh, for these master classes, arranging speakers, communicating with the speakers, uh, posting all the uh, all the uh, notices. Uh, all thank you so much for thank you Yogita for your wonderful work. Uh, we also want to apologize, apologize for a couple of things that uh, uh, over these master classes we had uh, some technical glitches because of internet issues or or other things. Our apology for that. And sometime we uh, we went upon your lunch time. Even today is now one forty, but still we are on. So our apology for that. Uh, let me now invite Dr. Uh, Saraswat. He want to speak to you a couple of. Uh, minutes for master class and what uh, so today we are closing the uh, the first phase of master classes uh, since uh, our annual conference is now coming we will have our annual, annual conference of isg on december 19 20 this year this will be a virtual congress so we'll stopping master class today and uh, we'll meet at uh, isg con but we also have since we have an online platform we will certainly think of doing uh, more master classes, uh, maybe not weekly, maybe month basis, but maybe uh, request Dr. Saraswati uh, to say something. Well, uh, I think thank you very much, Govind. I think all of you would agree that uh, Govind has been the dynamo and the engine who has driven the master classes with a bit of uh, help from here and there and some tips, but 99% uh, of the work has been his. Uh, all good things come to an end. And I think this today we are doing our uh, last session of the ISG Masterclass uh, Series 1. So six months uh, continuously, 16th April now to almost uh, mid-October and about 31 sessions. It's been a good run. And as, uh, there, as uh, Govind has pointed out, all of these uh, activities are now available to ISG members as well as others who come to our website to view and from other sites that has been mentioned. Uh, I think we need... Uh, a lot of feedback, I'm sure Govind is planning uh, um, to circulate a questionnaire in which we would request all ISG members, all our faculty who have participated in previous sessions, all our seniors. As I said, many of our seniors have uh, been very supportive and have um, uh, participated and given us very good uh, pointers about how we should continue in the Series 2. One thing is clear that uh, we would uh, continue our focus on BMD and B residents and tailor the content of the uh, master classes in series two also mainly for uh, this category. And I'm sure that is something that will help all the other gastroenterology um, practitioners in our country to benefit from this. Uh, sometime, I guess, in the uh, towards the middle or the end of January, we plan to begin series two and uh, maybe make some changes. Hitherto, it's been mainly a didactic format and the last seven have been a panel discussion format. Other formats, other areas that we need to focus on, what else we should include. We have some thoughts, but we would really welcome and appreciate feedback from all of you who are the participants and the audience, as well as the faculty to tell us in which direction to move. Uh, right, so I don't think I need to take stand too much longer between you and uh, your lunch except to say that I need to thank everyone on this panel today. Dr. Uh, Goenka's uh, planning, his inputs, his uh, complete immersion and involvement with this. Uh, if he, had, he has material on his uh, laptop right now to run this session for another half an hour, 45 minutes. But uh, I guess uh, uh, we'll have to plan for this during our second phase. Each one of the panelists has been outstanding in their focus and giving us clear messages, what to do now about specific problems. And although it's been a lot of content, which may not 
sink in there's that's where the value of the library comes in that when a specific point in a specific patient arises you are able to go back to the master class and see how their input would help and also know who's the person in the country to contact if you have a problem like this and you are a bit at sea handling what are the best options so with these words i think i'd like to thank everyone and uh, over to you govind and to uh, mahesh if you have any last words before we wind up yes um, i must say that i have uh, attended some of these master classes i could not attend uh, some of them but whatever i attended they were all really masterly actually as as the name designates and uh, it's a very very useful library which we should have not only to the junior gastroenterologists but to everybody in the country and maybe outside the country as well i must thank isg the secretary and the president vivek uh, and govin for organizing this and we look forward to starting the second master class series too and on for today's thing i think we were given a very short time uh, i remember govin called me last sunday only but i think with the support and the cooperation of the secretary at as well as the panelists we could do a reasonably good job thank you very much uh, thank you everyone uh, thank you so very much i think uh, uh, this lunch time so uh, we we'll log off and uh, see you soon uh, but to uh, see you at uh, isc and one last note uh, isc con december 1920 thank you all and have a great day ahead bye 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 see you Thank you.